The sermon title is, What Type of Soul Are You? Now, this is one of many different types of shoe sermons that are out there. And probably many of those shoe sermons have similarities and, and all of them have some differences. And this is Jonathan Harless's version of a shoe sermon. What type of soul are you? So in this sermon, we're going to compare different types of shoes with different types of Christians. So you will discover that there are some shoes that as Christians we should not wear, and there's some shoes as Christians that we should wear. And you've heard the saying, if the shoe fits, wear it. That's an expression that points to an uncomfortable truth that is often hard to accept. And we've all heard the saying, I'd hate to be in their shoes. In this sermon, you might discover that you're wearing some shoes that you shouldn't be wearing. And we are all familiar with the saying, if the shoe fits, wear it. But should we? We should sometimes change it. Uh, this is a sermon of introspection, self-examination. All sermons should be self-examination. You hear God's Word and you want to apply it to your life. There might be some things that you're doing right and you just keep on doing them. There might be some things you need to change and you work on those things. 2 Corinthians 13, 5 says, Test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. Or do you not recognize that about uh, recognize this about yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test? And then the Old Testament book of Lamentations says in Lamentations three forty, let's examine and search out our ways, and let's return to the Lord. This sermon might step on some toes. But if, they do, if I do, I'm aiming too low because I want it to hit us in the heart. You may discover that you are in some shoes that pinch and hurt a bit, but only you can change the shoes that you are wearing. Now let's begin learning some soul lessons. So the first section is dealing with work and our work and our work ethic. What type of soul are you when it comes to your work? Are you a loafer? Are you a house shoe? Or are you a work shoe? The first shoe that we're going to look at is the loafer. Now, I have fond memories of when I was young. The guys would get the loafers and they'd put pennies in that little spot spot right there and I was always playing with the penny uh, but anyway enough about that the loafer so this shoe is lazy and doesn't work the loafer Christian tries to get by doing as little of the Lord's work as possible they are the spiritual slackers the lazy they want to do just enough to keep from going to hell and just enough to squeak into heaven. However, this won't cut it. The Bible doesn't talk about how little we need to do. Instead, 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says, Therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, be firm and movable, always excelling in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. The Bible condemns loafer Christians. And I don't know if you know this, but Matthew chapter 25 has a lot of loafers in it. If, if you will, you might want to follow along in your Bible. Um, Matthew chapter 25, 1 through 13 is the parable of the ten virgins. And five, the five foolish virgins were unprepared loafers who could not enter the wedding feast. Unprepared loafers. At the end of the chapter, we have the parable of the sheep and the goats at the final judgment, Matthew 25, 31 through 46. And we notice that the goats are loafers who did nothing 
to help the needs of their brethren and are told to depart into eternal fire. And then we come in the middle, the parable of the talents. In Matthew 25, 14 through 30, And the one talent man was a loafer who knew what he needed to do but did nothing with the talent he was given and is thrown into outer darkness. We don't want to be a loafer. Matthew 25, 24 through 26 says, And the one also who had received the one talent came up and said, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. And I was afraid and went away and hid your talent in the ground. See, you have what is yours. But his master answered and said to him, You wicked, lazy slave. You knew that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I scattered no seed. And then if you drop down to verse 30, Jesus says in this parable, Throw out the worthless slave, some versions will say the unprofitable servant, into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Could Jesus say that to us? Could Jesus say... Um, that we're a worthless servant or slave, an unprofitable servant? Could you be punished for being unprofitable? Brothers and sisters, if we only have one talent, we need to be using it. Amen? We sure can't earn our salvation. I liked how that Paul stressed the grace at the when we were partaking of the emblems. We can't earn our salvation, but we also can't get to heaven without working in the kingdom of God. Although most do not feel that church work is important, it is the only work that will last beyond this world. So, if the shoe fits you, if this shoe, the loafer, fits you, should you... Wear it, or should you change it? Change it. I like that big thud. (laughs) Guys like loud noises sometimes. Uh, The next shoe is the house shoe. And we have two lovely house shoes. One men's and one's ladies' house shoes. Oh, the house shoe. It's so soft and comfy and relaxing, you might even fall asleep in the house shoe. Similarly, the house shoe, Christian, is too relaxed and comfortable in their relationship and service to the Lord. Church is just a box that they are checking off, a routine that they have been doing for years. They are content with both the church and their own self to not be spiritually growing, nor numerically growing. There is no need to stretch yourself spiritually or sacrificially give your time, energy, and money. House shoes, Christians, house shoe Christians just want to keep doing what they have always done. The house shoe Christian is scared off by any new idea or program that requires effort or a leap of faith. If you ask the house shoe to do anything extra, they probably won't budge. Ask them to come to a work day, be part of a new ministry, or get involved in benevolence, visitation, or evangelism program, and they likely won't show, or if they do, put forth much effort. If they show, they won't put forth much effort. Additionally, additional reasons why the house shoe Christian may uh, not want to start anything new is because it might require additional giving of their time and money the house shoe has very little faith and zeal for the lord's work some of you might be familiar with amos chapter 6 and verse 1 woe to those who are at ease in zion the nasby says carefree in zion we can get too comfortable in the church And when we get comfortable, 
We're not stretching ourselves to grow and become more like Christ. Matthew 19, 16 through 22 says, And someone came to him and said, Teacher, what good thing shall I do so that I may obtain eternal life? Now, Mike, just talk to us about this. If you drop down to verse 17, Jesus says, Keep the commandments. And then he lists some of those commandments, but notice he skipped one. He did not say, Thou shalt not covet, because that's what his problem was. The young man said to him, All these I have kept, what, uh, I've kept. what am I still lacking? And that's what we need to ask ourselves. We might be doing a lot of things right, but what are we still lacking? Jesus said to him, If you want to be complete, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. See, he, his problem was his possessions. He was covetous. He, had, he, had, he was greedy. But when the young man heard this statement, he went away grieving, for he was one who owned much property. What about you? Have you lost your vision to try new things for God? Are you willing to, to reach out to the lost, that lost person? Go to more church services. Teach that class. Minister to that hurting person. Romans chapter 12 and verse 11 says, Not lagging behind in diligence. Fervent in spirit. Serving the Lord. These are things that Paul is writing for Christians to engage in. Not lagging behind in diligence, but be fervent in spirit. If this shoe fits you, should you wear it? Or should you change it? Change it. Now we come to the work shoe. These just happen to be some steel-toed work shoes. The work shoe actively works and always is about their father's business. The work shoe Christian is always on the job for the Lord. Workshoe Christians are strong, reliable, and tough because of years of service, experience, prayer, study, and application of God's Word. Workshoe Christians seek first the kingdom of God, Matthew 6, 33, and present their bodies as a living sacrifice to the cause of Christ, Romans chapter 16, 1 and 2, or chapter 12, 1 and 2. If I put 16, it's 12. I just caught that. Workshoe Christians develop and use the talents they have been given and show through their example and obedience that Christians must be willing to sacrificially work for the Lord everywhere they go, no matter their age or venue of life. In John 9, 4, we must carry out the works of Him who sent me as long as it is day, night is coming when no one can work. We're not promised tomorrow. And even if tomorrow comes, we might get to a point in our life that we're unable to do some things for the Lord that we could have been doing today. In the parable of the ten virgins, Matthew chapter 25 does have a lot of loafers in it, but it's got a lot of work shoes in it too. In the parable of the ten virgins, the five wise virgins were prepared work shoes. Work shoes who were prepared, who entered the wedding feast. In the parable of the sheep and the goats at the final judgment, the sheep are work shoes who help meet the needs of their brethren and inherit the kingdom prepared for them from the foundation of the world. And then in the parable of the talents, the five and two talent uh, men are work shoes that use the talents that they were given and are told, well done, good and faithful slave or servant. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter the joy of your master. Well, that's what I want to hear on Judgment Day. Don't you? Amen. The church needs work shoes. We need transporters, greeters, communion preparers, bulletin board designers, visitation ministers, prayer warriors, helpers that take care of the needs of the less fortunate, people who prepare for special gatherings, 
Volunteers who take others to neighboring congregations for special events. Card and letter writers, Bible class teachers, youth workers, etc., etc. Titus 3.1 says, Remind them to be ready for every good deed. Do you remember the recent bulletin article on the bees? The bees that literally wear themselves out working. They wear their wings out working. We all should wear work shoes for Jesus. Shoes worn rugged by years of dedication and service to the Lord. Isaiah 52 and verse 7 is beautiful. It describes the work shoe Christian. How delightful on the mountains are the feet of the one who brings good news, who announces peace and brings good news of happiness, who announces salvation and says to Zion, Your God reigns. If this shoe fits you, should you wear it or should you change it? You should wear it. The next shoe that we're going to look at, well, before we get there, we're going to look at change subjects. We're talking about work. Now we're going to talk about loyalty. What type of soul are you when it comes to your loyalty? Are you an overshoe or a rubber boot, a flip-flop, a Sunday shoe, a slipper, or an everyday shoe? The rubber boot or the overshoe? Loyal only in rough times. People put overshoes on or rubber boots on when the weather is horrible outside, when the ground is muddy and wet and cut or covered with snow. Likewise, the rubber boot or the overshoe Christian puts on Christianity when life gets nasty and rough. Many rubber boot or overshoe Christians vow when sick, in the hospital, unemployed, or when their family is falling apart, that they will go back to church services and become more devoted to God. However, when things get better, they soon start to believe they don't need God anymore and become unfaithful once again. The rubber boot or overshoe Christian only wants to be around God and His people when they, the rubber boot or overshoe Christian, needs help. Jeremiah warns us, about the overshoe people. Jeremiah 17, 13. Lord, the hope of Israel. All who abandon you will be put to shame. Mm, don't sound good, does it? Those who turn away on earth will be written down. Because they have forsaken the fountain of living water that is the Lord. We read in 2 Chronicles 12, 1. About Rehoboam and the people. And when they needed God... They were a little bit more loyal. But look at 2 Chronicles 12.1. When the kingdom of Rehoboam had, was established and strong, he and all Israel with him abandoned the law of the Lord. Mm-mm-mm. There's nothing new under the sun. Luke 9.62. But Jesus said to him, No one after putting his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. If this shoe fits you, should you wear it or should you change it? Next is the flip-flop Christian. The The flip-flop. It's got divided loyalty. The flip-flop's life is a pattern of faithfulness then unfaithfulness to the Lord. They are not happy in the world, neither are they happy in the church. They straddle the fence with one foot in the church and one foot in the world. Flip-flop Christians want a little church and a little sin. They try to serve two masters but can't. Matthew 6, 24, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. You know, remember, the way to be, to not be a miserable Christian is to be 100% dedicated to God. If you decide to just give Him part of your loyalty, 
then you are going to be miserable. The flip-flop Christian is spiritually weak and lukewarm. Revelation 3, 15 through 16, I know your deeds that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Podiatrist, warn us not to wear flip-flops because they, can get, they give no support and people often slip and fall in them. Similarly, the flip-flop Christian doesn't have firm foundation. Like the seed sown in the rocky soil, they are shallow in their spirituality and do not have firm, deep spiritual roots because they have not taken the time to grow spiritually. Do you know your spiritual growth is something that you have to be uh, deliberate in doing and seeking? Luke eight thirteen. those on the rocky soil are the ones who, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and yet those who... These do not have a firm root. They believe for a while, and in time of temptation, they fall away. 1 Peter 2, 2. And like newborn babes, long for the pure milk of the word, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. If this shoe fits you, should you wear it, or should you change it? Change it. The Sunday shoe... Or the dress shoe. The Sunday shoe or the dress shoe. Only loyal on Sundays. The Sunday shoe or dress shoe Christian is a once a week Christian. The Sunday shoe Christian concentrates his or her Christianity around the first day of the week. The Sunday shoe or dress shoe Christian may have one or more of the following symptoms. Okay? May have one or more. Symptom number one. Some Sunday shoe or dress shoe Christians may live like the world Monday through Saturday and dress up their hypocritical behavior to look like a Christian on Sunday mornings. Symptom number two. Some Sunday shoe or dress shoe Christians may have a false belief there is no need to come on Sunday nights and there is no need to come on Wednesday nights even if they are perfectly healthy and can can attend if they uh, would simply choose to attend. They often view these church services as interfering with their family time, interfering with their rest, or interfering with their TV and entertainment choices. The Sunday shoe or dress shoe Christian does not realize that Christianity uh, was never meant to be a Sunday-only religion. In Luke chapter 9 and verse 23, and uh, this is Jesus speaking, and he says, And he was saying to them, all, uh, saying to them all, If anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Now, Jesus says, in, in the, many of the gospel accounts, maybe all four, but at least three, Jesus says this statement. But Luke's account is the only one that says daily. He emphasizes daily. Deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. The Sunday shoe or dress shoe Christians do not realize that the church and righteous living are the priorities of life. The church and righteous living are the priorities of life. In Matthew 6 and verse 33, But seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be provided to you. And then we know about Hebrews 10, 25, but I'd like us to look at starting at verse 23. The New King James says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. How do we do that? How do we hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering? By learning more about God's Word and applying it to our life. Well, how do we do that? Through private or collective study. And collective Bible study is Sunday morning Bible class, Sunday evening Bible class, and Wednesday night Bible class. And then the latter part of verse 23 says, For he who promises faithful... Verse 24, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. 
One reason to be at church services is to encourage one another. And you can't encourage others that are at the assembly to love and good works if you are not at the church services assembling with them. How are you going to learn about a situation in another's life so to do a good work for them unless you're around that person? And Sunday nights, Wednesday nights are good opportunities to do that. Verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another so much the more as you see the day approaching. If this shoe fits you, should you wear it or should you change it? Change it. (laughs) The next shoe is the slipper. Oh, look at how cute these little fox slippers are. But they're not cute spiritually. They have a limited commitment or loyalty. The slipper... Christian slips into worship services at the very last minute and they are often late the slipper often skips bible study and then slips out the door as soon as services are over or almost over frequently these people have their hearts in the wrong place in Matthew 6, 19-21, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, or where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in or steal. Listen to verse 21. For where your treasure is, there will your heart will be also. The slipper Christian might not mind being at sports events or recreational activities for several hours, but when it comes to the local church, the slipper Christian wants quick and easy services. Short sermons, little Bible study, if any, and mere acquaintances in the church instead of close brothers and sisters' uh, relationships. The slipper doesn't give any more of themselves to the local church than they have to. Many slippers seldom support other congregational events such as gospel meetings, revivals, special events, fifth Sunday sings, special Bible classes, workshops, or lectureships. Though many may say these other services are not directly commanded, they do help provoke unity, spiritual growth, brotherly love, fellowship, and keep us busy about our Father's business. Thus, all of these other services help strengthen the church as a whole. A few questions for us. Do you support the services and special meetings of your own congregation here at Hill Street? Every opportunity that you can? When was the last time that you attended a gospel meeting or a special service at another congregation near Albany? Why should other congregations help support our congregation's meetings if we don't help support theirs. If this shoe fits you, should you wear it or should you change it? Change it. There's not as much thud with those. (laughs) The next shoe is the everyday shoe. For me, the everyday shoe is a pair of sneakers or walking shoes. But And then when they wear out, Uh, and I get a new pair, I use those a lot of times as my work shoes. But the everyday shoe, daily loyal to the cause of Christ. The everyday shoe Christian chooses every day to rid themselves of the old self and to put Christ on instead. In Romans 13, 14, the Bible says, "But Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provisions for the flesh in regard to its lust. Sometimes uh, we try to make provisions for the sinful pleasures that we like. And that's wrong. Ephesians 4, 22 through 24, that in reference to your former way of life, you are to rid yourself of the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit. And that you are to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and put on the new self, which is in the likeness, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness and truth. 
The everyday shoe Christian daily denies their self, takes up their cross, and follows Christ, Luke 9, 23. The everyday shoe Christians sacrifice their own will, die to their old self and sins, and follow Christ daily by seeking opportunities to serve in the kingdom, encourage other Christians, and study, uh, studying and applying the scriptures. If this shoe fits you, should you wear it or should you change it? Wear it. The next section deals with attitude. What type of soul are you when it comes to your attitude? Are you a high heel, high top shoe, or are you a low top shoe? So we're going to deal with the high heels and high tops. Those are some high heels right there. And these are shoes that have a high top. Now, they're not the high top basketball shoes, but it's, I'm just focusing in on the high top part their attitude is an attitude that's prideful the high heel or high top christian is the arrogant proud and puffed up person they may brag on themselves or what they have the high heel or high top christian may even brag on what they do for the lord and then seek recognition the high heel or high top often thinks that they are better than other people because of their social status education wealth Time in the church or power. An example of a high top or high heel Christian is, or person, I should say, is found in Luke 18, 11. The Pharisees stood and began praying this in regard to himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other people, swindlers, crooked, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. Yet no one is better than anyone else. Alexander the Great. Seeing Diogenes, looking attentively at a parcel of human bones, asked the philosopher what he was looking for. And Diogenes replied, That which I cannot find, the difference between your father's bones and those of his slaves. From Plutarch. The high heel or high top Christian won't touch, eat, with or evangelize the homeless, poorly dressed, or those who need a shower. James chapter 2, 1 through 4. My brothers and sisters, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. For if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and is dressed with bright clothes, and a poor man in dirty clothes also comes in, and you pay special attention to the one who is wearing the bright clothes and, and say, you sit here in a good place, and you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my footstool, have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? I put some other cross references on the on the PowerPoint that we don't have time to look at. But often these high top individuals feel that their earthly business success should guarantee them a leadership position in the church. The high heel or high top Christians are not humble and won't do what they consider to be demenial task or demeaning task. In Romans twelve and verse three. For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment, as God has allotted to each of uh, each a measure of faith. In Proverbs six sixteen and following, you know that there's the six things that the Lord hates, and seven are an abomination. The very first one is haughty eyes or a proud look. Don't be a high hill Christian. Make sure everyone is comfortable when they attend the services of the Hill Street Church of Christ. You know, go across that row and welcome the visitors, the strangers that you've never seen before. Because I, I guarantee you, they know the ones that walked by them or looked their way and didn't come over and talk to them. If this shoe fits you, should you wear it or change it? Change it. The next shoe is the low top. 
the low top Christian. Their attitude is humble. The low top Christian is a humble servant who doesn't brag about their accomplishments, admits when they're wrong, and submits to God's commands. The low top Christian has the Spirit of Christ. Jesus is God, but for the love of others, he was born in a stable, raised in a modest home, lived the life of a servant, and died a humiliating and excruciating death, all for you and me. Philippians 2, 5-8, through Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus was a low top. We need to be low tops. It says, Who was... As he already existed in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a bondservant and being born in the likeness of men. And being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, death on a cross. A low-top Christian is not afraid to get involved in serving. In Matthew 20, 26-28, It is not this way among you, but whoever wants to become prominent among you shall be your servant, Jesus said. And whoever desires to be first among you shall be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to serve, but to serve. I mean, not did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. A low top Christian is willing to humbly submit to the commands of God. Acts 2 and verse 38, that would include repentance, and baptism. And a low-top Christian will admit error and repent. Of course, I should have put a low-top person is willing to submit to the commands of God because you're not a Christian until you've obeyed the gospel at the point of baptism. And then after you become a Christian, a low-top Christian admits error and repents when it enters their life. In Acts 8 and verse 22, Peter says, Therefore repent of this wickedness of yours and pray to the Lord that if possible, the intention of your heart will be forgiven you. Like Christ, the low-top Christian does not brag or glorify him or herself. In John 8, 54, Jesus answered, If I glory, glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say, He is our God. If this shoe fits you, should you wear it or change it? Wear it. Absolutely. The next section deals with maturity. And this is where it speeds up because they're not as long. What type of soul are you when it comes to your maturity? Are you a sandal? Are you a baby shoe? Or a combat boot? The sandal... And this is a sandal if I ever saw a sandal. Wow. Not much there, is there? The sandal, as far as maturity, there's no growth or substance. The sandal Christian is just an outline of a Christian. The sandal Christian is simply a skeleton with not much substance because they choose to not grow spiritually into well-rounded service. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 15, the latter part says... We are to grow up in all aspects into Him who is the head, that is Christ. In 2 Peter 3.18, the first part of the verse says, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. If this shoe fits you, should you wear it or change it? Change it. Oh, look at these cute little baby shoes. Baby shoes are cute unless someone's been in the church for 20 years and they're still wearing them then they're not cute anymore the baby shoes maturity is little growth and immature the baby shoe christian is one who has had plenty of time and opportunity to mature but has not grown up yet The baby shoe Christian has not grown past the basic knowledge of God's Word and has trouble distinguishing truth from error. Sometimes these individuals have been in the church for decades and are as weak and spiritually poor in discernment as a recent new convert. 
A baby, the baby shoe Christian often avoids any form of deep Bible study or challenging Christian service. In Hebrews chapter 5, 12 through 14, For though by the time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the actual words of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unacquainted with the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature who become, who because of practice, the solid food is for the mature who because of practice have their senses trained to distinguish between good and, good and evil. If this shoe fits you, should you wear it or change it? Change it. The next shoe is the combat boot. And these might be the smallest combat boots you have ever seen. But they are genuine army soldier shoes. The combat boot. Maturity. Mature sacrificial service. The combat boot Christian is one who is willing to regularly sacrifice cares of the world their own comfort and pleasure, so to faithfully serve in the Lord's army. 2 Timothy 2, 1-4 through You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, and trust these to faithful people who will also be able to teach others also. Suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him. Every Christian should strive to wear combat boots. They should strive to be a combat boot Christian. Ephesians chapter 6, 10 through 18 describes the combat boot Christian. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. So combat boot Christians are to be strong. And they get their strength from the Lord. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. See, combat boot Christians can stand against the wiles of the devil, the schemes of the devil. For our struggle, they struggle, is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you may be able to resist. Combat soldiers resist. Combat uh, boot Christians resist. On the evil day, and having done everything to stand firm, combat boot Christians do everything in, that they possibly can to stand firm with Jesus. Stand firm, therefore, having your belt, uh, having belted yourself with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having strapped on your feet or shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you uh, will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, with every prayer and request, pray at all times. Combat boot Christians, pray at all times. In the Spirit and with this in view, be alert with all perseverance and every request for all the saints. Combat boot Christians are alert and they persevere in their prayer and they pray for other Christians on the front line. If this shoe fits you, should you wear it or change it? Wear it. Then we come to our final section. It's our sin status. What type of soul are you when it comes to your sin status? Are you a black shoe, a dirty white shoe, or a white shoe? The black shoe. Oh man, I think these might smell a little bit. Uh, 
I'm joking. I didn't smell a thing. I'm trying to elaborate on the illustration. The black shoe sin status is unforgiven, walking in darkness. The black shoe Christian is covered with unforgiven sins. Others can't tell the black shoe Christian from a person of the world. The black shoe Christian is a Christian by name only. The black shoe Christian lives life their own way. They don't think obedience is important. They give little or to nothing to the Lord, yet expect God to give them all the glories of heaven. You've met people like that. These Christians need to reevaluate their understanding of their commitment to Christ. In James chapter 1 and verse 27, pure and undefiled religion in the sight of God and the Father is this, to visit the orphans and widows in their distress, their service, and to keep oneself unstained by the world, there's purity. If this shoe fits you, should you wear it or change it? Yep. The next one is the dirty white shoes. Yep, they're kind of dirty. Especially if you get them in the light. The dirty white shoe sin status is undealt with sin. The dirty white shoe Christian carries the stains of undealt with sins. The dirty white shoe Christian has either a secret sin or a public sin that needs confessed and turned from. Or possibly a grudge that needs to be corrected by seeking reconciliation or forgiveness. 2 Peter chapter 2, 20-22 for if, af if after they have escaped the defilements of the world by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that means they became a Christian, they are entangled again in them, the defilements of the world, they are entangled in them and are overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. So uh, you become a Christian and then you get tangled up and go back to the world. For it would be better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it, to turn away from the holy commandment handed on to them. It has happened to them according to the true proverb, and this is how ugly it is. When a Christian who's been washed in the blood of Jesus, sanctified, made holy as Jesus Christ himself, not because of their power, but because of God's power and the power of the blood of Jesus, when they want to leave God and Christ and go back into the sinful world, this is how disgusting it is in God's sight. A dog returns to its own vomit, and a sow after washing returns to wallowing in the mire. A dog vomits and gets rid of the very thing that made him sick, and then he goes back and eats the very thing that made him sick again. Or a pig a sow that's wallowing in the manure and they get cleaned up, washed, and then they want to go roll in the manure again. That's how disgusting it is. It's so wonderful to become a child of God, but if you don't grow and study and learn more about God's way, Satan is out to get you. And if you go back into the world, then it's worse than if you would have never known the way of righteousness. If this shoe fits you, should you wear it or change it, church? Change it. And then the final shoe is the white shoe. The white shoe. Sin status, forgiven. Walking in the light. See that Nike symbol? Nike is a Greek word that means victory. And through Jesus Christ, the white shoe Christian can gain victory. The white shoe Christian represents a forgiven person who does their best to walk in the light. When the white shoe Christian realizes that they have sinned, they confess their sin in prayer to God and repent. In Isaiah 1 and verse 18, Come now and let us debate your cause, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they shall become as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be like wool. In 1 John 1, 7 through 9, But if we walk... In the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. 
If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous so that He will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, 1 John 1, 7-9 was written to Christians. It's never meant to be taken as what a non-Christian is due to, to, uh, to be cleansed. So, the white shoe. Sin status, forgiven, walking the light. If this shoe fits you, should you wear it or change it? You should definitely wear it. We all want to be white shoe Christians. We want to be um, low tops. We want to be everyday shoes. We want to be work shoes. And we want to be combat boots for, for Christ, for God. What type of soul are you? What, are, what can you improve upon? What can you do better? What do you need to correct? Do you need to change shoes? If you're a Christian and you have stumbled, ask for forgiveness. Change your ways and repent. Change your shoes. However, if you're not a Christian and you desire to wear work shoes for Christ, here's what you need to do to start your, your work for Christ. You need to hear God's Word. In John 6, 45, it is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. You have to hear. You have to believe in God's word and that Christ is the divine Son of God. In John 8, 24, Jesus says, Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am, referring to the name of deity, you will die in your sins. You have to repent of your sins. In Luke 13, 3, Jesus says, I tell you, nay, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. We're also to confess the name of Christ. In Romans 10 9 and 10, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, that means He calls the shots. He makes the decisions of your life. He's on the throne of your life. And believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness. And with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. And then you have to be baptized in water for the forgiveness of your sins. To be put into Christ. Where all spiritual blessings are, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3. Salvation's in Christ, 2 Timothy 2.10. All spiritual blessings are in Christ, Ephesians 1.3. How do you get into Christ? Galatians 3.27. For as many of you as been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And then, how do you, what happens at the point of baptism? Acts 22 and verse 16. Why tearest thou arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Your sins are washed away. Then you get to work and you continue to be faithful. Matthew 10, 22, Jesus was talking to his apostles, but it applies to us as well. And you will be hated by all because of my name, but it is the one who has endured to the end who will be saved. What type of soul are you? If you need to change your shoes, today's a good day to change them. Will you come forward as together we stand and sing?